Well, greetings, everyone, and uh, a big hello to you, my friend John Kaiser, just east of San Francisco City. How are you today? Gianni, I'm doing fantastic today. Glad to be on this uh, special program with you, talking about security of supply, which uh, was a big deal back in, in 2009, 2012, when we experienced Rare Earth Mania 1.0. But I think it's going to become a much bigger deal going forward, given how the world has changed in the past decade. Absolutely. So let me give a bit of background for why I believe this is going to be um, a, a very, very much viewed video uh, sought after. It's probably going to be shared with a lot of friends in the community. Anyone that follows commodities, natural resources, energy, and innovation and technology and how all these things are coming together, namely, what does it take to make it possible? And I recall from my background in electrical studies in the mid-1990s, a lot of the things they taught us were, they were science experiments. They simply were not commercially viable. I don't think anyone doubts that we are going into hyper-adoption of modern energy schemes and the, the economies all over the world are looking for hyper-efficiency in anything that consumes energy, big or small. And so what we're gonna talk about today is it's going to be a foundational, dare I even say, a master class in rare earth elements, the 1.0 boom, but maybe more into the critical elements that make possible all these different things that you hear about, batteries, wind power, electric vehicles, the integration of it all. And what's even the most important thing is the security of supply. Where do they come from? And all the nuances. And I don't think there's anyone, there's probably three or four people in the world that have studied and written research on this topic. Anyone that has followed this space, uh, I think will be fascinated by the things that we talk about today. And as we, we boil that down, and we don't even know how long this interview is gonna go, it's gonna be a back and forth. I hope you enjoy it, get a cup of coffee. You can turn it on and off over, over one sitting or over a weekend. But we're gonna go and start with the, give us a background. Rare earth elements that happened in 2010, 2011, Give us, give us a, a baseline. What's the foundation on that, John? Well, I'll give you an even uh, bigger baseline, and that is the super cycle that kicked in in 2003 when China finally started to come on stream as a major economic power. And the mining industry was caught, was blindsided by this. They did not anticipate it, and the demand for metals went up by an order of magnitude even. So we saw prices like copper go from 65, 70 cents a pound to as high as $4 a pound. And when it all came to an end with the 2008 crisis, uh, the metal prices settled back at levels substantially higher than, than what was going on before. Now, what made, what enabled China to do so well was this whole concept of globalized trade. When the Cold War ended, all of a sudden, all this carving up of the world in, into communist and non-communist uh, divisions, it ended and it became a thing of who can produce the metal the cheapest and who will pay the most for it. So everything went all around the world to whoever wanted it. And it was in this context of globalization that the rare earth mania 1.0 happened. It was, I believe, a major blunder by China. They dominated rare earth production 90% uh, or more. And uh, they started introducing quotas to uh, restrict uh, the amount that could go offshore to the rest of the world. But then in 2010, they ended in a skirmish with Japan over the Senkundu Islands and they escalated it and stopped shipping anything to Japan. And that triggered a panic because all of a sudden, the rare earths that were flowing freely from China at pretty cheap prices suddenly stayed in China. And to some degree, this was a strategy by China to force technology to move to China where they could have the access to these rare earths without worrying about it. And so magnet production and all that stuff is now is mainly in China and China won that battle. But the consequence of it was that rare earth prices went up 10, 20 fold and the juniors in the rest of the world, which managed to grab all those projects that had been abandoned before, similar to like what Ross Beattie did with his Lumina model ahead of the super cycle. And all of a sudden 
these worthless copper deposits were in the money. All of a sudden, these deposits around the world were seriously in the money. Enormous capital flowed into the juniors. They spent a huge amount on economic studies, uh, PEAs, all the way to feasibility studies. But not one of these projects uh, really got to the level of production, except for Mountain Pass, which was the original world-class rare earth mine in California that Molly Corp owned. And Molly Corp went public in late July 2010, just in time to catch this wave. And that project had $1.6 billion sunk into it, but never really made it into full production. The world reacted to the uh, uh, high prices by engaging in thrifting R&D. So everybody figured out how to use less dysprosium in the neomagnets. Uh, and the Chinese finally realized we're destroying our own market. Everybody's even substituting out of rare earths uh, as a result. And the prices have since crashed back to levels that prevailed uh, before the, the uh, blast off in, 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 in 2009. And th this was you know, a bubble and everybody assumed globalization. China was violating the rules of globalization. This can't last. Everything will normalize. But, and it did normalize, except now we have something weird happening. We have deglobalization happening. And that changes the logic completely. Now, just so people understand that the, there was the, that, pro, that Project Mountain Pass, the what was the value of that thing from, from peak to trough? What kind of- Well, Molycore went uh, public uh, uh, at $14 IPO. They, they raised, I think, about $100, $250 million or so. And they managed to uh, raise uh, uh, another billion, billion two in equity. But the, the founders, uh, they understood that this was a bubble. They sold uh, more than $2 billion worth of their founders' stock through secondary offerings. So this whole thing was a giant blow off because everybody knew these prices were not sustainable. And at the end of the day, uh, after they had acquired Neo Materials, they had 250 million shares out and they peaked at $79. So yeah. somewhere in there, it had a 10 to $20 billion market value. And the media was all over this. They loved this story about China putting the screws to the West. And here was this champion putting the old mountain pass back into production. But in the end, it died in bankruptcy. Yeah. You want to just adjust your camera just a little bit, John, just so your, your head is a little higher in the screen. I think that might help just a little bit. Yeah. No, the other way, the other way. The other way yeah. yeah, there we go. Yeah, perfect. Um, now, the, the juniors, the people that followed them, these things were just parabolic. They went from pennies a share to dollars a share. It was just a phenomenal rise. And of course, the fantastic crash that came with it. W something that people um, often forget is that America and Europe were built predominantly on cheap oil and cheap commodity prices. So what happened is everyone forgot about the, the developing world. You used to count statistics with the OECD and, a, and maybe Taiwan and a couple other periphery countries, but it was not emerging markets. All of a sudden, these people started to consume things, China uh, and Asia, Mexico, Thailand, Indonesia, all these different countries, and it was an creeper effect. They paid for it. China ended up paying uh, through the teeth for oil, for copper, for everything. We all recall that copper went, as you said, from 65, 70 cents a pound to $4 a pound. They were not happy about that. So in my view, they're a little bit more sophisticated. They're a little bit more strategic. They do have these, a really large strategic petroleum reserve, larger than the United States, with the United States is around 700 billion barrels. China is now around 1.1, 1.2 uh, billion barrels as we know. So. When there's ever a discount in commodity prices, I will submit to people that they're able to absorb a little bit of this inventory to smooth out the, the price. Not that they're manipulating the market. They're just trying to, you know, not get um, taken over the coals again by traders and speculators. Um, ironically enough, that's exactly what's going to happen, because if you have any commodity that stays at a low enough price for long enough, you end up 
having a void in expiration, a void in development, and you inevitably get a spike in that commodity price. And there's something that's developing uh, as we speak, in my view, in copper, where because demand is going to be very strong. The CAGR growth rate for copper will be three, four, five percent at times in this decade, simply because of the, the pervasive demand for copper throughout the global economy, namely its electrification. But there's something else that's happening. When you're looking at efficiency, to you simply use less fossil fuels in the first place, you're talking about lightweighting materials. So this is a two-part question that we're going to go into. First of all, we need to dive a little bit deeper into this um, deglobalization. Who is going to be the price setter? Who owns these commodities? And then as you start to have more efficiency, when we talk about the lightweighting of steel or adopting from steel to sophisticated aluminum that's very strong and very light, there are two critical elements. So it separates them from rare earth elements. And of course, to, to make steel lighter and stronger, we're talking niobium. To make aluminum sophisticated, strong and light, we're talking about scandium. And that's really where this, um, we're gonna di diverge, I think, a little bit from just rare earth elements because you don't wanna get caught into these things as, as some of the commentators that we know famously at conferences would joke with people, they would call not scandium, but scamium or, uh, it's so rare a material, they called it unobtainium, you know, and, and all the different names and jokes that they would come up with. This is different. I've been someone that tries to uh, focus people on future trends. I've, I've did it with lithium, electric vehicles, this energy pivot, uh, copper, which is still a story that's ongoing. I've recently done it with helium because it's a commodity that's been uh, taken up by big technology as a super coolant in servers rather than using more air conditioning. But what I'm trying to point out is that scandium, because of its use in sophisticated aluminum to make it stronger and lighter, if we can get supply. So there's a third part that we're going to talk about. So one, two, three uh, is the geopolitical situation. How does this work? And, and then, of course, the chicken and egg, because if we don't have scandium, if we don't have the deposits, your industry is not able to implement this scandium into sophisticated aluminum. So how can you put the first two together, the, the geopolitical situation and explaining to people how this niobium and scandium works? Okay, so the, the security of supply concept uh, breaks down into two categories. One is supply that are, you're taking for granted gets disrupted for potential local civil wars, like say Congo, say they have a major war there and all of a sudden the cobalt supply out of Congo, which is 60%. Well-publicized well publicized story. Yes, and, and so, so that's, that's another type of disruption. But a more worrisome type of disruption is what's brewing now, and that's a geopolitical disruption, which goes back to the old Cold War, and this is now being built as the new Cold War between the United States and China. And the, the, you're not, the attitude of the United States and everybody else during the globalization phase was that China would become eventually just like us. But that changed in 2012 when Xi Jinping became the, the leader, eventually leader, leader for life. And he took a hard-nosed view of uh, China as an autocracy run by the Communist Party. And it's become pretty clear that it is not going to be a democracy just like us. And so the United States has squared off against China, also acknowledging the fact that because they have a lower cost jurisdiction, lower labor costs, lower health and safety standards, lower environmental standards. Uh, they have an unfair edge in producing stuff, which has resulted in the hollowing out of the United States and the bite basis of all the populism that put, put Trump into place. And this is originally a Democrat idea, protectionism and being hostile towards free trade, where capital moves itself to wherever it gets the the lowest price without caring about uh, what's what's left behind, how the people left behind are affected. This, so no matter how this election turns out, this hostility towards China expanding its footprint is not going to go away. And as you alluded to, China has been very dependent on metals and it's been pretty aggressive about bankrolling projects in places like Africa, taking over mines to make sure that it can ship the raw materials that it needs 
back home. In fact, even its push into electric vehicles, it's not so much about worrying about uh, uh, climate change and so on, it's because their oil dependency is a major vulnerability. So they're firing all their electric vehicles with coal, which is very nasty for, for climate change, but they need to get away from oil dependency. But China's also a major supplier of a lot of met metals. Uh, tungsten is one, antimony is another one. These are boring metals that go into the macro economy. They supply 80, 85% of that. And then there's uh, rare earths, which we've already mentioned. If this conflict uh, escalates, then we could see this supply disrupted. The other thing about security of supply that's a, more of a feel-good thing is new technologies coming on stream, like electric vehicles and lithium-ion batteries. All of a sudden, you have new demand coming in, and it's a slow adoption curve that suddenly goes exponential. But the market is a supply and demand balance thing. So in a lot of these metals, we're seeing relatively low prices that make projects in other parts of the world, like North America, hopeless to develop. There are dozens of rare earth deposits outside of China, but every single one of them at the current rare earth prices is, is marginal. So the question becomes, what's going to drive the price of these metals higher so that it is worthwhile for companies to acquire and develop them? Is it going to be a disruption of the supply or an escalation of demand due to new technologies coming on stream. And that's a big paradox that many of the companies out there that have these big deposits that don't quite work at the metal prices we have today are, are struggling with because the market says, you need $30 cobalt to put your sunrise deposit, nickel cobalt scandium sunrise deposit into production, but it's 15 bucks right now. Yes, but in 2025, 30, when the EV market goes exponential, you're going to need a lot more cobalt than the existing mine infrastructure can supply or even incrementally increase. So how do you overcome this problem that the future price will be higher and it takes three to five years to build and permit a mine? How do you get the capital in there now, even though when you crunch the numbers, the thing has a negative present value? So this is a, a huge problem that's uh, hurting the both the future and and the, and the juniors that have these projects. And you almost need the yeah, lo negative and behold, type of Lo and behold, they're floating Mountain Pass once again on it's a, it's a New York Stock Exchange? Yes, and, and, and so Mountain Pass, they built all three stages, the flotation that produces a pre-cacked concentrate, the cracking segment that uh, produces a sort of a mixed oxide um, mess because it all drops out together in one mess, but you want separated rare earth oxides. And they also had a separation plant, but it never really got working properly. And then when the rare earth prices crashed, it didn't matter if it worked properly. And right now they are taking or pushing it through the flotation circuit, shipping it to China, selling it for a hundred million bucks a year on which they make 30 million bucks of of profit and the Chinese do whatever it is and it doesn't actually come back to America. So they've just kept this thing going as a cash flow thing after uh, you know buying it out of the bankruptcy. But last week they announced that they are going to merge with one of these uh, uh, blind pool shells on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, they're going to raise 300 million bucks at ten dollars. Uh, the the, the company is called MP Materials. I don't know what they'll call themselves when they go public. Uh, It'll probably happen in the fourth quarter, and and uh, they they will have about a 1.5 billion dollar valuation. And their plan over the next two years is is to refurbish these these two circuits that never work properly and make America a a turnkey producer of separated oxides, so that magnet production and that is feasible in the United States. Now, none of this makes sense if China continues to sell rare earths at the current cheap prices. So embedded in this going public uh, sometime in the fourth quarter of this year is the expectation that the conflict between China and the United States will escalate and we'll start seeing supply disruptions of rare earths. And then there will be enormous pressure on them to hurry up 
and get this going again so that we can bring the supply chain closer to home rather than have it all originate in China. And when this thing becomes public, it'll be the first major stock that Robinhood traders, that anybody, uh, investment funds can put into their portfolio and say, this is my hedge against uh, this deglobalization process going out of control and there being severe shortages. And I think in this iteration, unlike the, the Molycorp one from 2009 to 2012, this company is not just going to be a liquidity event for the investors. I think this company will become an American critical metals champion that acquires some of these other juniors. In the first Earthmania 1.0 iteration, everybody was stabbing each other in the back because they knew they were only going to be displacing part of Chinese supply. Now it's potentially displacing all of Chinese supply, plus with demand from the whole electric vehicle industry and that, and, mm -hmm. and wind turbines and that going through the roof, the total demand will even eclipse what China is able to produce down the road. So this time it'll be a longer running story with a better feel good type aspect to it. And that's exactly the point. One of the key, th key things I wanna underline, in fact, it's, this cannot be underlined enough. And I love it, Don Cox always says this, never invest in the story on page one, that's the efficient market. Invest in the story on page 16, that's headed to page one. So all of these planets are aligning. You've got the scarcity of supply, deglobalization, hyper adoption of these modern energy schemes and these technologies that require more of these things. And then you have a champion, a leader, like Mountain Pass or MP Materials going public, where if it's if it has adoption, if it is on page one, if it does have some kind of share price appreciation out of the get-go, this always trickles down into the next wave of, of companies that actually have a real project and a real concept and a lot of money that's been sunk there and they're trading at pennies per share. And if we can start differentiating, as I say, these ones, you, some of these lesser materials you cannot pronounce, or we want to stay away from these things like unobtainium. But because of the lightweighting of steel and aluminum, niobium and scandium are two uh, commodities that you should be more familiar with. And you'll start associating them maybe a little bit more like a lithium or like a cobalt. Doesn't mean they're going to have a huge market. But the question is, if it starts entering page one as a speculator, and that's what I am, I'm going to start looking at opportunities that are trading at pennies that if more attention is put to them, I want to be part of that education process and I want to be ahead of the curve. And that's where we are right now. It's early days. And, and I think that uh, some of the things that are happening in this space right now are going to be very exciting for speculators. John, please explain to people another potential game changer that's happening in the steel and the aluminum business. You can go and vice versa. I don't care the order, but if you want to talk about what Rio Tinto has done in Quebec or some of the advancements in steel, give, give, some, give some color on that. Well, the, the light weighting concept that you mentioned wasn't one that was talked about a lot during Rare Earth Media 1.0. There it was all about the neomagnets that uh, make hybrids and electric vehicles, hydrogen fuel cell cars work. They're all part of it. They're also inside uh, your, your laptops. Uh, and and this, this, this light weighting has to do with anything that moves. And the ultimate lightweighting metal for steel is niobium. And you, you put less than 1% into steel and it strengthens it substantially. And it also makes it corrosion resistant. And those are two very important things. And the niobium market is a $3 billion market today. It was nothing in the early 60s, uh, but that began to change when the CBMM family realized that the uh, Arasha deposit on which a uh, resort was built because it was a hot spring association. It's a Brazilian family, correct? Yes, it's a private private family. Uh, they, and ironically, Molycorp, the old Molycorp, was actually part of this original deal, but they didn't have the brains to, to stay in it at the time and sold out their position. But this deposit is a monster. It's a, like five, 250 million tons of a 2.5% niobium uh, pentoxide. And that's about five times higher than all other projects and deposits in the world. 
This was a game changer when it came along. And right now, CBMM from Arasha is about 80% of the supply, and it could be 100%, but it realized early on that there was reluctance amongst steelmakers to adopt niobium as an alloying agent because they did not like dependency on a sole supplier, which at, the, at that time, Brazil was a dictatorship. Yeah. And even it's today, it seems to want to become a dictatorship again. And, uh, and, and so they, allowed, they, they picked a price level that allowed projects like Niobec in Quebec to come on stream. And I Am Gold had that for a while. They sold it to a private company called Magris about eight, nine years ago. And in 2010, while all the uh, fuss was on the rare earth stuff, a consortium of, uh, of, of Japanese, uh, European, uh, 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 Korean uh, um, steel makers put a billion bucks into CBMM and a Chinese group put a billion bucks also into it. And this was part of that went into the pockets of the CBMM family, but the rest went into assuring that Arasha could be scaled up and that there would be a stable price for niobium going forward. So in terms of price appreciation, you're not going to see anything except maybe uh, inflation adjusted increases over time. Uh, uh, the price is 16 to $19 per pound for ferro niobium, 40 to $45 per kilo uh, in, in those units. And, and CBMM will manage it. They'll maintain their 80% supply. And this space is growing at about a six cents uh, compounded annual, six and a half percent compounded annual growth rate. So if you have a niobium project that's got high enough grade and proper recovery characteristics, there is room to insert yourself into the future. Um, but for scandium, it's a completely different story. Now, I, hold on a second. I want people to understand crystal clear what's gonna happen here. So niobium, niobium was effectively one deposit. They had, an, uh, let's say, a, a holy alliance with people that required it so that the price would be stable for a long period of time, and they fed industry. But scandium, and going into aluminum now, this is a multi-deposit situation, but there's a couple different types of geology as well. So there's the laterites, which are, you could talk about them, and then you have some other opportunities where I think people should be they, they, they should really focus some attention on some of these other opportunities within that space. But right now, they do not have this alliance, so to speak, with the aluminum industry. So the aluminum industry is looking, who can give us this material over the next 20 or 30 years reliably at a decent price so that they can come together and that market can increase, you know, 10 or 20 fold. So give us the background on, on what's going on with Scandium. So the, the metallurgists have understood what scandium can do for aluminum since the 50s. Uh, what, if, you, if you alloy scandium into aluminum, um, it uh, bestows significant strength. It bestows co corrosion resistance. And most importantly, overlooked by most people, is the, it enhances its weldability. With aluminum, you have problems when you weld a joint. The uh, joint isn't as strong as the surrounding material unless you do special treatment afterwards, which is why airplanes are all riveted together and not welded together because you can't have along these joints a weak point where shear will tear your, tear your plane apart. But uh, the problem with uh, scandium is that it's a dispersoid. It's the very reason it plays this special role in aluminum, and it can add enormous strength even at 0.1% con contribution. But it is more abundant in the Earth's crust than lead, and yet lead, you know, you, you get like 10, 20% lead deposits. But the dispersoid nature of scandium inhibits it from concentrating. And on until recently, the richest deposit was the Softy Vody deposit in the Ukraine that the Soviets found next to an underground iron mine. And it was enriched to a, a whoop de doo 130 ppm, which is about four times crustal abundance. But they were able, because they were a communist entity and didn't care about costs, this was a great supply for scandium. And they built their MiG fighter fleet out of aluminum scandium alloy. And when the Soviet Union collapsed in uh, 
1989 or 90, um, th it was over because it was not economic uh, when there wasn't a, uh, a military purpose for this anywhere. And so the world lapsed back into this. Yeah, there's scandium all over the place. It's in the dirt in your backyard, but it's way too expensive to put it into a concentrated form and make a master alloy out of it and feed it into the uh, into your aluminum products and get that strength. But in the mid 90s, there were discoveries made in Australia and New South Wales and Queensland where these laterite deposits were peculiarly enriched to 300 to 600 ppm. And since then, uh, at least four of them have been taken to the feasibility level. And now you have a potential for $1,500 to $2,000 per kilogram of scandium oxide to be available as almost an unlimited supply. So this problem of having no resources to mine, it has been solved. But a new problem has emerged, which uh, is this chicken and the egg problem, in that uh, current supply is somewhere between 15 and 25 tons per year. Some of it comes from a byproduct from the giant Bionobo rare earth mine. Some of it comes from titanium dioxide waste stream stripping. You, know, you make your pigment and then the leftover stuff, if you're using the sulfate process, there is some scandium left, which they are recovering. Some is recovered from uranium in situ leaching. Uh, and and uh, Sumitomo has an operation where from a nickel cobalt deposit, these things have 50 to 70 ppm, and if they're able to recover uh, scandium from that operation. But none of these sources are significantly scalable. And this is just a pitiful $50 million market. So a company like Scandium International wants to produce 35 uh, tons per year. That's, that's, that's more than, uh, that's doubling total supply. But since it takes a couple years to build this and commission it, and you have to raise the money in advance and the people who have the money say, well, I want to have the, the, the revenues guaranteed. I want offtake agreements. But the end users who need to roll out a new product line uh, deploying this scandium alloy, they're saying, I have to wait how long to get this material? I'm not committing it. What if your chemical plant doesn't work? What if you can't sell it to me? Then, then I'm screwed. So this all these companies have attempted to crack this chicken and the egg problem. The Scandium International had a two-year program of doing these letters of intent with end users, experimenting with it, showing them how to use it. And the conclusion in most cases is, yeah, this would really work. We could make money introducing this into our product lines, but we'll do a deal with you when you're producing it. And they kind of crashed and burned at the end of last year with even Robert Friedland failed to crack the chicken egg problem from his Sunrise Nickel Cobalt project. It could produce 75 tons a year. And if he got that up and running, he would just stockpile it in a warehouse until the market evolved on its own. Okay, so what what is Rio Tinto done in Quebec at, at their aluminum facility there? Okay, so this, this is the the game changer, one of two game changers that have emerged this year. Uh, you know, Scandium looked like a dead story at the end of, end of last year. But one of the developments that came out is that Rio Tinto, which has for decades operated the Lacteo iron titanium mine in Quebec, it has an operation in Sorel Tracy, which is about 50 kilometers north of Montreal, Basically, it's, it's a furnace where they dump the iron titanium ore into it. It completely melts. They strip the iron out. And the slag turns out to be 80% titanium dioxide. And for decades, they have been shipping this to the uh, pigment makers who use the sulfate process and, and making a ton of money from this. Now, now, when you hear of titanium, you think of, oh, like, like special titanium metals and all that. Well, titanium alloys are 3% of what titanium is used for. 97% goes into paint whitening, whitening products. It's, it's quite a boring story. And most of it comes from heavy mineral sands, which have ilmenite or rutile in it. But pigment makers are using a chloride process increasingly for, for whatever reason. And it requires 90 to 95% uh, 
titanium dioxide feedstock. So Rio Tinto had a problem on its hand in that the market for its 80% titanium slag was evaporating. So they had to develop an upgrading process to bring it up to the 90, 95% that everybody wanted. And in the process, their scientists uh, figured out a way to recover the scandium because the lacteal deposit has 30 to 50 ppm of scandium in it, and it ends up reporting to the titanium slag. So I estimate, they haven't publicized any numbers, but I've done some calculations. I estimate that from Sorrel Tracy, they could produce up to 50 tons of scandium oxide per year, maybe more. And of course, Rio Tinto bought Alcan. It has its Alcan division in Quebec. So now it's in a position to recover the scandium on an as needed basis. And the solution to the chicken and egg problem is to, is to supply the market gradually, instead of going from one big shot, you, you know, from, from 20 tons a year to suddenly make it in a 60 ton per year market, and you need that kind of a minimum critical mass to, to develop a primary mine in the first place, now you can increase this gradually. And Scandium International had realized too through its LOI program over the two years that the end users wanted to be getting bigger samples to test wanted to be getting this stuff even during the construction commissioning phase of the primary mine. And so they said, we'll build our own little melt shop and make master alloy, which they figured out how to do. But where do we source our, source our, our scandium oxide? Well, we can go to China. They're selling it cheap right now because they don't have enough of it to bother doing anything. China is the world's biggest aluminum producer and the biggest needer, needer of uh, you know, lightweighted aluminum, but they don't have enough of it to make it worth their while. So, so Scandium International was in a pickle and they pursued their own strategy for solving this problem independently, which I'll talk about a little later. But the Rio Tinto thing, when this came out about a month and a half ago, it was huge because now they could start cultivating this offtake market without having to do any big capex. This was a byproduct of a coming up with a solution to a very big, exp potentially expensive problem. So now the market's looking and saying, okay, these guys can do it. Uh, Kronos could probably do it with its Telnes mine in, in Norway. So we have potentially 100 tons of scandium coming from these two major magmatic titanium sources. Everything else is mineral sands, and it doesn't really have a high high uh, uh, titanium uh, scandium content. So this, this is a game changer. And in my calculations, you know, I looked at what the work that Scandium International had done, and I could see over a decade, a thousand tons per annum demand evolving if the supply could be ramping up steadily. And this is the jump starter, the cracking of the chicken egg problem that will get Scandium rolling. All these companies that are sort of stranded and have pitiful valuations right now, yeah. they are going to become much more interesting over the next couple of years. But this is an important thing to articulate now. The aluminum industry, what is aluminum? It's effectively congealed electricity. If you have cheap sources of electrical energy, you think of Norway, Canada, Iceland, you can bring in the bauxite, that material can come from anywhere in the world, which is typically what happens. It comes from uh, Africa predominantly. And the market is massive. So you're thinking right now, people are listening, well, hold on a second. These guys can, can spoon feed themselves Rio Tinto from one mine for one facility. That's their internal company strategy. So what I see coming together here, if you could look at the tapestry, you've got this geopolitical situation where people are trying to have some independence. You have now a company like Molly Corp that's coming to be the poster child for these things to have a resurgence. You have the entire innovation technology um, efficiency of global energy that's going into hyperdrive for either critical components and or the lightweighting or the wanting to lightweight aluminum and steel where these things can survive in a very holy alliance where you you actually look at the the best deposits so if we look at those few scandium deposits there's not a lot of them there should be in my view as a speculator there should be a lot of interest for these projects to garner not just 
from speculators like myself that understands junior mining, but actually generalist investors that go down the food chain that look at what's next. And if we could differentiate now, where are the four or five most developed, uh, most well-known scandium, scandium deposits? They're actually, for, for, I want to focus people's attention very selfishly here as an investor, but to, to the province of Quebec. Quebec has two opportunities, one in Niobium, but particularly one in Scandium, with um, with a company you've actually been to the project, is my understanding, some years ago in the uh, 1.0 boom. Uh, can you let's maybe talk about some opportunities that you have looked at, or you've kicked some rocks, or you understand from years past? Wait, well, but before we do that, I want to articulate the other game changer thing that has emerged because we can't rely on Rio Tinto to actually follow through with this on any quick pace. And it's the rapidity that is the key. So the Scandium International guys, their CTO Willem Divesting has experience with copper leaching out from way back in the 70s. And, and, and he realized that their LOI strategy was not going to solve the chicken egg problem. And he collected copper raffinates from a number of mines in Arizona, and elsewhere in the United States that do SXEW processing of copper. And he determined that there's a significant amount of scandium in the waste stream that gets pumped back onto the pile and mixed with additional acid until the pile is depleted of copper. And they filed a patent for a method of recovering not just scandium, but other metals from this waste stream uh, in, in late last year. And they finally came out and told us about it in May, and they are now negotiating with the, the Freeport, uh, which is the largest of seven such operations, and several others for deals to set up this waste stream cleaning operation. And this is a huge deal because if they can get that scandium from that, then they can feed their own melt shop. So with these two parallel things going, Rio Tinto is going to be looking over its shoulder and saying, oh, we can't take our time with this. These SCY guys, if Freeport does a deal, they're going to be able to produce a bunch of, uh, of scandium from this byproduct source also. So, so we better hurry along. And of course, what SCY's goal is, is to build up the offtake order book the, 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 in this gradualist manner, because they already have the Ningen mine permitted to go into production. All it needs is 100 million bucks, and it's, and it's almost shovel ready to get going. So with these two tracks evolving, um, that opens up the space for these other projects. There's several in Australia, the, uh, the, the Owendale project that Platina has, uh, the Stony project, the Flemington that's next to Owendale, and then of course, Robert Friedland's uh, uh, Sunrise project. Right now, Cleantech's focused on the, the larger nickel cobalt uh, scenario with this um, 67 ppm scandium byproduct, but right next to it, is the original, um, what they used to call Syrestin. It is the richest scandium deposit in the world, but right now they're focused on the bigger picture thing. But these things could all come on stream over the next five to six years, each one adding 50 to 100 tons, marching towards that uh, you know, th you know, thousand tons per year. But then the question comes, okay, so you get 100 tons from, from the, uh, the, 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 the Rio Tinto style of titanium deposits. Uh, uh, you get maybe 100 tons from all these other byproduct sources such as titanium dioxide waste stream stripping and, and that and maybe 100, 200 tons from red mud way, way down the road. But where do you get the additional primary supply that comes on stream five, five, five to 10 years from now as it's now a no-brainer to put a 50 to 100 ton mine into production. And that's where um, the, the, there are other magmatic deposits different from the, the laterite deposits, which are very expensive to process. You have to throw acid, heat, and pressure, basically an autoclave at them to put the scandium into solution. But Scandium International has the Kibinimi deposit in Finland, which is a, uh, a magmatic-based thing. It's lower grade, but probably has better production characteristics. But the one in Quebec that is the most interesting one is owned by Imperial Mining Group. It is called a Crater Lake deposit. It used to be called Misery Lake. I was actually at that site during my, a site visit in 2009 when we went up to look at the Strange Lake project that 
quest uh, rare metals had, which was a heavy rare earth enriched uh, deposit. And this thing, it, they don't have a resource estimate yet, but they have a large system of um, uh, uh, scandium enriched in the sort of uh, 100 to 200 ppm range. Um, that's not as high as those 300 to 600 ppm ones in in, in Australia. They but, also uh, report a little bit differently too, right? They're reporting it two different ways, the Imperial. Yeah, they, they see scandium oxide is 50% heavier than the scandium element. And most, the, the convention is to report the assays as elemental scandium. So when we talk about 300 ppm, that's actually 450 ppm scandium oxide. And it's kind of like it muddies the water, confuses things when you puff up your grade using a, a, a scandium oxide grades relative to what everybody else is doing. But, but that's neither here nor there. At the end of the day, it, it's the scandium that counts. The oxygen basically comes out of the air and adds itself to it. Uh, mm -hmm. A scandium mm -hmm. a metal, you, you, you have to end up making that. In fact, you blend scandium oxide, it's a white powder, into your aluminum melt. And the oxygen, the temp high temperature just blows off the oxygen, so it disappears. So it's just scandium that's uh, in the uh, in, in in the aluminum alloy. But the market prices it as an oxide because that's generally what you ship and transport it as. Yeah. So continue with Crater Lake. So you were you were at the site. The the company. Uh, it's one of these examples. So for for disclosure, I own this one. So I'm very selfishly motivated that people really understand. Imperial as a sub 10 cent share. Uh, they are just closing their financing right now and they are going to drill this 1500 meters this summer. They will have enough um, drill density for a resource and they're also working towards completing uh, an initial PEA, preliminary economic assessment. And this will all happen for about a million and a half dollars, which in my view is going to able th that the company and the project to have a what should be a re rating and a better understanding. And this dovetails perfectly into this alignment of planets where you have mountain pass or MP materials going public. You have this, this strive towards the chicken and egg thing where you have these breakthroughs. There is room for multiple deposits. It's not about one or two, but it's about an industry and potentially a larger company wanting to have exposure to something like this, where I always believe a small company has a very difficult time building a mine. They shouldn't do that. It's a different skill set. But if you can take a project, um, de-risk it to a certain point, and create a fair or strategic partnership. Me as a shareholder, I just want to see it get to that next level uh, of de-risking, which in most cases comes with some kind of a, a, a market cap appreciation. So I'm going to follow the news uh, very closely this summer, but it's just interesting that you were actually at the project some years ago, and before, I think it was even before it was a discovery, correct? Well, the, 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 it was recognized that it was a type of a ring, it showed up as a ring structure in the uh, Magnetics and and it is a, a some sort of peralkaline uh, intrusive complex that has had a collapsed structure around it. And these things are sort of layered. The different uh, elements fractionate out at different levels. And and what what's happened is it's collapsed inwards. And so the layer in which the uh, scandium got enriched are sort of a uh, sub vertical pointing down. And they've started drilling this off. And they have very significant widths and uh, this could be a very long-term supply. Uh, its, its, its location is very remote. They will never build a chemical plant up there to, 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 to you know, solve an extraction plant. So they'll need to have a concentrator, get it floated down to uh, some concentrated level, kind of like they do with mountain pass in stage one, and then build a road and truck it farther south to set eels or somewhere like that. Where, where there's lots of uh, you know in, industrial capacity and set up your your plant there and this thing's great for Quebec because thanks to Quebec's hydroelectricity it has a strong aluminum smelting industry and so to be able to have a local source that's substantially large that I mean all these deposits Ningen I mean the the, the original operating scale would would operate for 200 years at that level. So obviously there's expansion potential. So Crater Lake, I think, will be a very important scandium resource in the future. They do need to do the 
the more the, 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 the final cracking and recovery of metallurgy on that, uh, finish the resource estimate so that we can see uh, you know, how much there is and how much they're going to target for mining. And, and so I could see something like this coming on stream five years from now. The stock is, is in the pennies because the market doesn't really understand the game-changing development for Scandium that this Rio Tinto development that Sorel Tracy represents and this uh, strategy that Scandium International is now pursuing with the copper leaching. This chicken egg cracking solution is huge, which is why I've become quite depressed after following the Scandium space for 10 years. But now I see it's, it's like opening up, light weighting is interesting to whether you're a climate change skeptic or believe climate change is real. Everybody likes to spend less money on fuel, driving your car from here or there. The aluminum industry would love to have an unlimited supply of, uh, of scandium so that they can um, you know, compete with steel because aluminum's problem is it's not very strong. And some of these other series like lithium, that they're very difficult to work with. Uh, if it breaks, it requires very complex uh, equipment to repair. Whereas aluminum scandium alloy, you, you make your Ford truck bed out of that. And, 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 and say a missile drops from the sky and punctures a hole into it, you'll be able to weld it back together again. Whereas with the lithium aluminum alloy, no way can you do that. So this, this, I, this is a game changer, and I think there'll be more deposits like Kivanimi and Crater Lake discovered. But you know, you first have to look for those, then you got to go through the delineation cycle. Uh, Crater Lake is at a point now where it deserves to be accelerated in terms of delineating the resource, getting the metallurgy sorted out, defining the economics, starting the whole process of where are we going to build a plant, and all coming on the backs of this game changing solution to the chicken egg problem yeah and i encourage so i guess from my understanding so um through this summer and this season they're going to do the drilling they're going to get enough data for this preliminary economic assessment and they're going to do what they're calling phase three uh, metallurgy so phase two was for the flotation process and now the phase three is going to be for the hydro metallurgy uh, on that project which is a, a very important as you are already highlight uh, uh, highlight for us and um I guess this news flow will come over the next sort of three or four months, but um, it'll be interesting to, to follow uh, what, what will take place and all the things that we discussed about. And also in Quebec, niobium. There's, an, there's uh, something that you like within the niobium space as well, correct? Well, the niobec mine is, is in southern Quebec, and it's been operating since, since the early 70s, and it is very deep. Uh, lots of It can operate for another 15, 20 years but it's not really going to expand its supply. The project that I'm following very closely is Nio Bay Metals, which is just on the Ontario side of the, of the border with Quebec in the James Bay lowlands. And this was discovered in the mid 60s, was taken to feasibility by Bechtel, uh, but they ended up never developing it because its location was remote. Nio Bay came on stream, Another deposit in Brazil came on stream that's now owned by the Chinese. And so these three sources have pretty much uh, uh, dominated the supply in the world. So Nio, not the, James, the James Bay deposit, uh, similar grade to Niobec, coarser mineralogy, so better recovery characteristics. It's potentially the fourth one to come on stream. And I've done the numbers on it, that that company will also be putting out a PEA Later, later this year, hopefully uh, in, in September, which will give us the cost structure. And this is important to emphasize with, with projects like Crater Lake and, 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 and James Bay with weird metals like niobium and scandium. The key to these things is what is the cost structure for recovering what amount of material? And once you know that, then you know what the price is going to be. And this there's is a lot of price insensitive stuff that can easily handle $1,500 to $2,000 a kilo. And I'm pretty sure Rio Tinto and its Alcan division are going to identify these earlier price insensitive adopters that are very happy to pay $1,500 to $2,000. And there's even innovations happening in the uh, 
you know, battery material space that could end up allowing an even higher price yeah. of scandium oxide to be completely viable. To give people context as well on a kilogram basis, you know, copper is $3 a pound or $6 a kilogram. So we're talking, you know, this material is very valuable, whether it's a thousand or 1500, you know, look at the price difference. Um, let's wrap it up, John. It's been, um, it's been a good hour with you. Uh, lots more to talk about, lots of news to follow. And let's see if these planets can align where there would be a, we're not going to call it a rare earth element. We're not going to call it a critical element. We're going to call it uh, innovation and technology and the things that make it possible and hyper efficiency and all the building blocks, including the lesser ones like scandium and niobium and a security of supply where they will want to have these, um, these projects. Yeah, so, so one final thing I'd like to say, the Scandium space is about taking a $50 million market to $2 billion over the next 10 to 15 years, driven by projects that the juniors control and helped out by some of these things that Rio Tinto control, which aren't scalable in the way primary supplies are. Most of the uh, other critical metal space is about anxiety, about disruption of supply, about needing to have closer to home, shorter supply chains uh, in, in jurisdictions which are not going to get caught up in a new Cold War conflict between China and the United States. So one is something that you actually don't want to happen. So it kind of means you got to be a, a pessimist. And the other is a feel good thing that, wow, this is something that's a win win for everybody. If it happens, it's, it's great for everybody, which is why I love the fact that this chicken and the egg problem finally looks like it's solved. Perfect. Well, I'm a speculator and I speculate in junior mining shares. So I have one concern that can a sub 10 cent per share Pico Cap Jr have an appreciation because some of these things we talked about become start entering the front page of, uh, of newspapers and magazines around the world. I'm speculating on it and uh, I like Scandium. And of course, uh, for disclosure, I own Imperial. So uh, let's leave it at that and we'll do a follow up in the um, coming months. Let's see how this whole uh, MP materials IPO goes live. Yeah, sounds good. And I am a shareholder of Scandium International. Okay, very good. So everyone knows, right? We're selfishly interested here. Okay, thank you. We have a conflict of interest. Indeed. Okay. Talk to you there, John. Thank you, Gianni.